Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. What's up? Nicely shaved. Looking good. Yep. Yep. Uh, the unkempt look had to go. Yep. You're embracing your baldness. Just, you know, come home, as they say. Charles to uh, Charles Barkley says to LeBron. <laughs> yep, come on home. Uh, all right. Um, so many questions this week, and I feel bad about not getting to some <laughs> over the last few weeks. Yeah. So let's kick this thing off. Welcome to the crossover. Today is <laughs> we already have an episode title. Welcome to the crossover. Today is. Friday, September 22nd, and we always start with mail days, of which I have a little pot. Nice. You have any? Mm-hmm. All right, well, I'll rifle through these quickly. Oh, and well, my first mail day, so I don't know if you can really see how cracked. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I... I dropped this the first day of the national and uh, let me just talk to the camera for a second. Things were getting treacherous last week on the crossover. So the screen was so broken that it would just randomly push things in the broken spots as if like the pressure from the cracks. So like, I, I think I kicked a few people from the stream accidentally last week. That was not me. Accidentally. <laughs> that was <laughs> That was the broken phone. Uh, so I'm on a new phone now. Apologies to everybody who can see me more clearly than they previously could. All right, here's the, some mail days. This one comes courtesy of Coleman Cards. Michael Jordan, 1997, Metal Universe Championship, All Millennium Team. What? Like what? Is this your, first, your first MJ mail day in like a year? Uh, maybe not quite a year. The last one I got was a records collection from Upper Deck, not that long ago, also from Coleman. But yeah, so we got that in from Coleman. And then I may have shown most of these at some points, but I got them back. These were submitted for grading uh, with PSA at the National. So Le'Veon Bell, Press Proof Black, a from Donruss, a Jokic Select Gold, a Luka Prism Gold that got a PSA 10. One, one of only four PSA 10s in the 27 card order. <laughs> uh, this yeah. McCaffrey, Don Russ Elite, one, one of one, and a few other. Two McCaffrey NT tag, one of ones. And finally, a McCaffrey Majestic PSA 7, one of one. Nice. All right. So are you on a new item? Phone. Is this the iPhone 15 you're in? This is the 14. Okay. Christina yeah, and I like made the call to go get a new phone right before the 15 came out and try to avoid dealing with lines and stuff, I guess. So we started this process Thursday, and then it's just it's very annoying trying to get these uh, the service switched over. So yes. Wait, you switched, but you're still on the same... Service. Yeah, I'm, I mean, right. I'm still the I'm still the same service provider, but activating the new phone, which we bought from the Apple Store, was it it took several hours today. Well, I'm like super close to switching to Apple because I texted a friend and I asked him something like, you know, we were gonna like meet up or something. I forget the context, but he didn't respond. And the next day, I was like, so I guess we're not doing that today and he's like what do you mean I, I texted you last night and he sent me a screenshot of his reply and i didn't get that text and i was like well you're you're this close android to having me throw you in a lake and then today my wife texted her friend something similar like hey are we on for tomorrow didn't reply next day she's like what the heck she's like i did reply so my wife said that to me and i was like oh now you've done it 
Android. Now you now you pissed off the wife. Like you're you're close to getting trashed here. Oh boy. Well, you know, isn't that the big uh, the big Apple scam? Is that they make your tech show up in a different bubble, and uh, yeah, they just they ostracize you until you you're bullied into submission. I don't actually think it's an Android thing. I think it's an Apple thing, isn't it? It is. It's a hundred percent where Apple is like, ooh, text from Android. You know, if like if this is one out of every hundred, let's go ahead and just drop that. Like not enough to make you realize it's a scam, but enough to be like, eh, it was an accident. We drop every once in a while, but it's like, eh, maybe not an accident. Fair enough. All right. I don't, I don't see you switch it, but I could be wrong about that. Good. Right. Don't me. Perfect. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> a little reverse psychology to get you over on a team Apple. Yeah. If for nothing else than to just like conform to my the people around me, it's fine. <clears throat> okay, announcements. Do we have any card ladder related announcements this week? No. No. Okay. All right, Christina. No. Nope. All right. Let's get to our questions, which there are many, and a strong theme this week about people wanting to talk about parallels and different types of cards and stuff like that. Nice. So that's why I put this one up front. From nines are fine. Just want to say how awesome the first two parallel episodes of Brett's Stacking Slab series has been. And uh, Brett has interviewed myself and Josh so far <laughs> for that series. <laughs> so, he's, really, he's really going outside of his comfort zone with that. Yeah, he is, yeah. So um, we're going to have a lot more questions about that later on throughout the show, different parallels and stuff. But I think that's, a, that's going to be a, a boon for content. And I, I was listening to your interview with Brett today and um, it just got me fired up. I, there is like when hobby content is done in a way that sort of has collectors talking about how they think about collecting and giving me information about sets and talking about specific years and the differences between them and stuff like that's just the stuff that I crave. So yeah. And you can tell like when, you do the same thing though, but when I would answer, uh, Brett is almost like thrown back that it wasn't like from the from the perspective of the investor. He's like, "You're saying that like that's how collectors think about it." And like, is there another way? You know, like I don't even know. Do, do we even have another way of thinking about this? You know, like this is kind of the way that you and I just do it. You know, right? I thought that was like, you know, the conversation about uh, is fifty too many? Like it was just like a fun thought exercise. For sure. Okay, well, we'll get more into that as we go on. First question, or next question, is from Bruin Killer, who's, who says, what's with this Deion Sanders pump, and how bad does Oregon beat Colorado tomorrow? Well, they're favored by 21 and a half, so we're, we're looking for about that range. That'd be, that'd be ideal. I'm I'm like rooting against Colorado now because everyone is so in. When the Rock is on the sidelines, the way you said that to me was so funny. Like when the Rock is on the sidelines, I now have to root against you. That's just how it goes. Yeah. And uh, be vigilant out there if you are looking at buying Deion Sanders cards. I know some are. I do see a, a larger influx of um, obviously shilled Deion mm. Sanders cards coming through. Card Which one? His, his like score for rookie or like rare stuff? No, I don't know about the rare stuff. Um, that may, I I no I I couldn't comment on that. The ones that I've been seeing suffer from this are his uh, eighty nine score PSA ten rookie and his eighty nine tops traded um, mm -hmm. PSA ten rookie. Those two have. Those, like, for example, the uh, the 89 tops traded typically sells between $125, $175, something like that. And there will be, like, multiple sales, $250, $300, $350 at auction. Um, you know, while while other copies are listed as bins for $130, $140. Bucks, so. Right. Obvious. Yeah, yeah he's, in a, he's in the dead zone for cards a bit. Because his rookie year is just maybe the worst rookie year you could have in sports cards, where it's like not vintage, is nothing rare, and it's just right in that junk wax area, like Emmett Smith and you know that like 
eight and Barry Sanders rookie card is just so overprinted that it's if it's really it'd be really hard to like build a really cool Deion Sanders collection until you get into like the you know mid nineties PMGs and stuff like that. So that's why I was curious if you've maybe seen anything in sales history that's like whoa fifty thousand dollar Dion PMG red you know something like that. Yeah. Uh, so Josh, Deion Sanders' uh, second highest selling card of all time was an SGC ten pristine of his eighty nine score. Um, his third highest was a PMG championship. I'm not sure if it's called that in baseball, but that's it's the PMG championship design from basketball. His fourth highest was a Rubies. What do you think his first highest selling card was? And it's not from the 90s. It's not from the 80s. It's not a rookie card. It's not from the 2000s. Uh, I already know what it is. It's like a Prism baseball black finite. Uh, I don't know. It, if it is, it's not in. Uh, it's not on the public mm-hmm. record. I thought you were you were steering me towards some prism black or something. I'm steering you. I'm steering you towards something even worse. Worse? How could? <laughs> what do you mean worse? Is that bad? Um, like an unlicensed, like worse in that sense. No, no, worse in your in your sense. Worse. Worse is in. Oh. Uh, it will. This is the card that might trigger you the most. Just show me, because I don't have no clue. Kaboom! <laughs> Damn it! Yes! Yes! Deion Sanders' highest selling card of all time is this <sighs> gold kaboom PSA 10. <laughs> you want to know something funny about that? I, I still pick off random Todd Gurley cards, so I, I follow sales history Gurley sales, and the only cards that sell over $100 are like kaboom silver Todd Gurley's. And I'm like, these rookie RPAs sell for less than a kaboom silver? It's just whatever. Nice. Nice. All right. Um... My personal question about Deion Sanders, is Deion Sanders just an influencer, but just on the biggest stage? Is he just one giant influencer? Bingo. Yeah. Is the thing, influence. Here's the thing that triggered me this week where I was like, all right, time to, time to put this guy in his place. He is a college football coach, correct? Right. Does that, doesn't that seem like something that requires a lot of attention and time and you're managing like 80 – teenagers basically not teenagers but you know there's like very young people ever that seems like and this dude is on every interview i've ever he's on every channel he the morning of the game is on game day with the rock and i'm thinking like aren't these kids like where's our coach i'm like this this, dude screw this guy this is ridiculous he's an influencer he's a marketing wizard guy that just is on tv pumping his own brand i don't like this (laughs) what do you think about that Dude, I love it. You told me uh, when we were talking about this earlier this week, you were like, you know, nobody's carved out any real estate for themselves on the uh, the prime time skepticism island. And you were like, that's real estate I want to have. <laughs> it's just like, it's really, you know, everyone likes him right now because it's, oh, Colorado, what a great story. And, you know, it's making moms watch college football, I think is one of the lines I heard. And I'm like, I'll be the one that says this is stupid. This guy sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it was so amazing to me because uh, ESPN had been lining up the Deion Sanders promotions for like months and months before the season. Maybe even it was somehow related to him becoming like an ESPN fran- ESPN brand friendly person and pivoting away from like the Barstool group or something. I don't, I don't really know enough about this, but uh, it it. it, it they they set the table for this, and then you know now he, he is on an impressive winning streak. We can give him that, like three and zero. Oh. <laughs> He's about to go through an absolute gauntlet of a schedule. He's going like the Pac-12 has. I know a little bit about college football. Um, that's why I'm so annoyed. Is because like when I want to watch college football, which is not much, it's like that's all I see. It's like oh my god, here's more Dion on sixty minutes and Dion talking to whoever, right? Um, but the Pac-12 has like four of the top quarterbacks in the nation. And so like the offenses are absolutely elite in the Pac-12 right now, which is ironic because they're about to break up. But like, this is probably the best they've been in a decade. And he's about to face like all of them here in like the next like five weeks. So it's going to, you know, he's not going to go five and zero. like he's going to lose some of these games. Dude, Vegas is like minus 21 and a half. That's a monster line. 
Yeah, that is the Mazarin. That's how much they were favored by last week, I'm pretty sure, and they went to overtime to squeak out that win. So. I don't know how they won that game. I watched the second half. How are they winning this game? You know, it's like the magic of the mystique of Dion or something. And he's just standing there. He's like, guy's not even doing anything. What are you talking about? Well, his, his sons are pretty good. Yeah. Uh, definitely. I watched that game, too. I haven't turned on a college football game in years. And if I ever do watch college football, it's usually by accident. So you did watch. He got you to watch. You were influenced to watch college football by Dan Sanders. <laughs> I was I was influenced, and it was a great game too. It was a really it was a good game. But now, will you join me and root against them? Oh yeah, hundred percent. We I can't root for an influencer. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it. Like the sunglasses, they get it's all just lining up. Like where he's selling his sunglasses now at this point, you know. It is lining up. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll see though. We will see. Desmond Ritter is two and up uh, so far this <laughs> year. Dude, he was horrible. And you, you texted me. You're like, every time I turn on Red Zone and they show Ritter, it's him making a terrible pass. <laughs> <laughs> In the fourth quarter, he did pick it up. He did, and he is two and up. So, all right, we're gonna see. We're gonna see here. Uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow night. Um, okay, next question here from Yeah Man Cards. What is the worst take that you've heard recently? The worst <laughs> worst take. Uh, uh, the worst take that Dion's a good investment right now. <laughs> that was pretty bad. Okay, so that all right. That's that is totally fair. Um, I'm use I'm going to use this question to get on a small soapbox. For just yes. Thirty seconds or so. <laughs> Join the hate. Join the hate train. Now, this is not a hate. This is the, this is an opposite of a hate train, but it is going to be a very unpopular opinion nonetheless. Um, so the main two people probably that I hear the most sports takes from are Bill Simmons and Ryan Rosillo. So naturally, that's who I'm going to take issue with, right? Like these are the two guys saying stuff, and uh, that's what. Well, Rosillo came out today in his podcast and admitted to being wrong about the 49ers trading for Christian McCaffrey. I heard that. That that was a bad trade when it happened and he, he owned it and he's got another bad take about the 49ers. That I think he's going to have to own soon too, which is he said that Brock Purdy would not be a good quarterback on any team other than the 49ers. That's what he said. And look, Brock Purdy, is not Josh Allen, he's not Tua, he's not Mahomes, he's not Aaron Rodgers, he's not Brady, he's none of those guys. He's not Lamar, he's not as good as any of those guys, not yet. But, okay, but, I know, I know Russillo likes to look at QBR, I know he likes to look at that. Last year, Purdy was top five as a rookie. This year, He's top three. He is 11 and 0 in games in which he attempts at least 10 passes. So when he plays, he do, he has not lost when he plays. Yes. It, quarterbacks definitely benefit from going to good teams. All right, but we didn't penalize Josh Allen for doing that. We didn't penalize Lamar for doing that. We didn't penalize Mahomes for joining a 12 and 4 team or whatever he joined. I don't get why Purdy gets dumped on constantly when the metrics say he's elite and when he's off to an 11 and 0 start as a QB. And by the way, before he took over as starter, the 49ers were 7 and 4 and the season before he took over, they were 10 and 7. Good team. No doubt about it. But the worst take I've heard is that a guy who's 11-0 and and top five in QBR would not be good on any team other than 49ers. You're Sorry, gonna, Ryan. You're going to let Nick Wright get, get away with his take on this? Did well, you hear what his I didn't know. I didn't hear what he did. He basically at the beginning of the season was pushing for them to start Lance this year, Trey Lance. He was like, I don't see why you would go with sort of like 
like the lower ceiling of Purdy instead of going for the higher ceiling of Lance. That was basically his take. Instead of like, like maybe, I mean, what's the ceiling on Purdy? He's already like eight and zero, or he was eight and zero at that time. It was like that ceiling seems pretty good. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think what it is, Rosillo said it today on that or that not was that today or yesterday where the pod you're referencing he said something like um he's not like ripping these really difficult long out routes across the hashes and maybe that's part of it where like you know Allen is just like firing these 80 yard bombs Lamar Jackson is obviously super electric running the ball Herber is like 6'5 slinging these giant throws across the field it, it might be that I'm not I'm not saying that's a, a valid reason I'm just trying to like understand as well. Like, is it that he's like boring or something? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I know. And like, he went so far as to say, you know, put Daniel Jones in uh, the 49ers because Daniel Jones is obviously a superior athlete. <laughs> he, he See, that's worked, what I'm saying. The athlete, like, yeah. he, people want like him to be a certain way. He he went so far as to say, uh, you know, just sort of dance around the idea that Sam Darnold should start over Purdy. Because, you know, Darnold is a superior athlete, more gifted athletically than Purdy is as well. The guy is 11-0. and 0. Yeah. Let, all right. Once he loses a game, then I'll hear takes about how uh, he should be replaced by Daniel Jones. Yeah. I'm kind of just, like, going to keep rolling with this theory that – because, like, the guys who are really popular are Lawrence – Herbert, and they're just like these prototypical tall, strong armed, sort of like flashier quarterbacks. And the guys that aren't as popular are like too well because he's a little shorter. You know, he's not like he's not running around and stuff. And then Purdy, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And then like with the NBA, people want like the high flying wings, and they don't want the big centers. You yep. know what I mean? No, I know. It, like it was the same thing with Tua last year. You know. Two is not the prototypical, big, menacing, you know, yes. multi-threat QB who's throwing 100 mile an hour out right. routes and right. running people over on uh, fourth and one QB snakes. Dude, right. Alan is not running people over. He's like jumping. <laughs> he has these weird plays where he's just like jumping into piles. <laughs> Dude, he takes the dumbest risks. <laughs> I know. He's been doing that forever. Ever, though. I remember that Texans playoff game that they lost when he just like lateraled the ball. He had a crazy lateral. I don't, I don't, I don't need to rehash that. People like Mahomes, though, because he does have like the ripping fastball and he's got the, he's got the like no look passes. He's got the underarm throws. He's got the running ability. He's got the flash and the hair. Like he's just kind of got all that stuff that collectors and people look for. And stuff that just really jumps off the page, and he's winning. So Mahomes is kind of this. Pur- Purdy's got the winning of Mahomes, but he doesn't have all the wildness. I guess is maybe is why people want it. They, they, it's like they want him to fail, so they're like, "Ah, oh, he's not very good." You know, he's he's mid. He's playing for this great team. It's like the guy literally hasn't lost. What the heck does he have to do? I know, I know. All right. So thank you, Ryan Rusillo, for that segment of contents. All right. Now we've got a longer question, a few longer ones, so let's just bear with the question and then we'll react. This comes from The Mellow Collection. What percentage of new participants do you guys think the hobby is in the hobby, do you guys think are strictly about buying and reselling? So for example, when I came into the hobby in 2020, I was brand new and had zero prior experience. So I used YouTube as a source for sports card content and almost all of it revolved around which cards to buy because it was going to go up in value. It took me almost a year to stumble across collector content and finally see amazing cards I've never seen before. And that's when I immediately knew that was the content I enjoyed and I have not stopped curating my collection ever since. What do you guys think we can do as a community to help new participants in the hobby get exposed to at least 40% collector content. That way they can see both sides on an equal playing field and let them decide their path to what they want to pursue in the hobby. Hmm. That's a lot, a lot to unpack. Um, you want me to take a stab at it? Yeah, take a stab at it. 
the percentage is so hard, uh, the first part of it, you know? And so I'm going to be conservative and say like 50-50 people in the hobby that are primarily collectors versus primarily is the, is the word he used investor or flipper, whatever. He said strictly about buying and reselling. So yeah, I mean, you could go with investor or flipper. I don't know. It's probably more than 50-50. Just again, like I just feel like we get so much uh, visually content wise of the non-collector stuff that we feel like it's a higher percentage, but I still just in my interactions with people on eBay and, and random Instagrams, I, I still do feel like it's a lot more collectors than, than we might think. It's just that they're not as vocal and I'll just keep saying that. And what can we do? To, uh, he's basically saying like, what can we do to make sure people coming in find the, the collector stuff? Yes, correct. Um, I think we need to be more aggressive as a community, propping up the people who are doing that and then criticizing the people who are not. Yeah, uh, that is, <laughs> that's totally fair. Um, yeah, this is, this is a tricky one in part because, you know, most great collectors either don't have the time or the desire or both right. to put their content out there. Right. Like, and on the other hand, it seems like uh, people who are taking, let's call it a more entrepreneurial approach to the hobby, they definitely have the motivation and the desire and the time to build a brand and they, and building that brand is part of what they're trying to do. And those things just, just go hand in hand with each other. Um, but the thing that I worry about a lot is I see three different worlds, three different potential worlds of hobby content landscapes. The first one is a world where there's just a sea of collector niche content and that's it. And so like when you come into the hobby, you know, you sort of pick and choose and find a lane and gravitate to it. And I think that'd be a totally fine world to live in. Um, the second world is one where you don't really have anything, right? Like you just kind of, you know, kind of like the content landscape when we joined back in 2016, 2017, where that landscape was like you had message boards, you had forums, and, you know, if you wanted to go find content, you could, but there was one or two podcasts, you know, some old cool YouTube videos of some breaks and stuff like that. And that was it. And that world is fine too. I don't worry about that world either. Um, it's, it's that world is just like a blank canvas and you really choose your own adventure in that world. But the third world, the world that I worry about and the world I think we're in right now is that, uh, when new people come into the hobby, who are the faces of the hobby and what culture and what perception does that create in the hobby? Uh, what, what, what does that, how are people welcomed and what type of, what type of people will be welcomed and what type of people won't be? And, and when, you know, I often think to myself, if I were to rejoin the hobby right now, would I, would I rejoin the hobby right now? You know, if I came in and I saw that this was the community, would I, um, would I, would I want to be a part of this? And I have to think that I wouldn't want to be a part of, of that community based, based on the surface level content, based on what you see when you type in sports cards on Google and the first things that come up, it's not promoting any of the aspects of the hobby that I love. And it's, uh, you know, maybe that wouldn't be a barrier or a hurdle for most people. Um, but I think I worry that it would be for me. And I think that's the one thing we, that, that <laughs> like I, I drew this example like a year or so ago, I listened to the, to a local Mavericks podcast and the guy, the host of the podcast went on a little riff making fun of Jason kid and he compared Jason kid to sports card dealers or flippers that he sees advertised to him uh, on his social media feed. And he said, look, this Jason kid, like he appears 
like how these sports card, you know, hustler, scam artist guys look. That was his crit. He was putting down Jason Kidd by comparing him to the social media image of, of sports card content that's been pushed to him. And there are like specific examples of card content that gets advertised to people that's like, look how I made so much money selling cards. You know, you can do it too if you just buy into my program or, you know, and it, and it has, it, and the die has already been cast, unfortunately, to where this is the perception of the hobby now through because of the materials that are being advertised because of the people who have dominated and taken over the content landscape this is how we are seen to outside people and it's an, it's embarrassing to me it's an, it's embarrassing so that's that is the world that i worry about josh is 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 I, the first two worlds would be fine this third world though i think something's got to give i don't think we can sustain this way yeah, yeah so is there anything concrete you can think of for yourself and, and me and the show that we can do to make sure we don't get to that point or slow it down um <laughs> maybe the market can crash a bit more <laughs> <laughs> i mean that helps that helped a lot yeah yeah um it's it's all it's i worry that it's an unsolvable problem yeah um yeah. <laughs> i just I worry that uh, that it's going to be a byproduct. It's, it's just a certain combination of influencer culture, social media algorithms, the opportunity to make money, and that's that's a recipe that uh, you know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know where we can go with this. Someone in the chat pointed out, and you're you're saying it now too, that. Uh, these algorithms do favor that content and you and I have seen that, you know, to be, be true because we like report those accounts and we don't follow them and we dislike them and everything we can do and we still get it pushed to us and we're not getting, and we're not getting pushed like, you know, as much of Kimmy posting his cards or, you know, random collectors picking up cards or whatever. And we're getting pushed that stuff, which is crazy after all the, saying no that we've done to that and it still keeps coming up and it's just because you know instagram and those uh algorithms they favor like the reels they favor like the specific types of engagement and so whether it's positive or negative so that's what keeps getting pushed yeah man that's that makes it uh that makes it really tricky um (laughs) to deal with this and uh but I, i guess we should take some comfort in the fact that I'm seeing some comments in the chat that like this isn't unique to us. That uh, mm-hmm. also other sectors, the finance sector, deals with influencer content. I remember immediately being repulsed by content about ChatGPT and AI because so many influencers commandeered that topic mm-hmm. in that space and started just making this these like pump pieces about all the things that ChatGPT can do for you and like su- subscribe to my newsletter and I'll you know, teach you how to best use it and stuff. And it just turned me off to, it, it, it made me a hater of artificial intelligence as a commercial product because all I saw were influencers marketing it and pushing it and trying to tell me how they're going to help me make 500, 500 extra dollars a week using it. Yep. And just pushing all these, let's just call them promos on me. That uh, and so I can totally see how like that podcast host that I was referring to how he would think the same thing about sports cards. You know, I can totally, I can, I get it. I get why he felt that way. What about this as a a, a take or a way to take solace in it is that um, it kind of gives us more of a feeling of like we still have this niche thing. We're like sort of hiding from this this thing that we hate, and we have something to point at that says. You know, this is the wrong way to do it. It kind of gives us a little bit more self gratification that we're kind of doing it the right way. We're in this like fun community of people who have this like common enemy almost. Like it kind of gives us this little underground feel that we've had. Or do you just want it where like literally all of us are collectors and like you said, all the content is just collector content. You just got to figure out which of it's your favorite. Do you almost like having this sort of invisible enemy that we're chasing and fighting? That's a really interesting question. It certainly helps us define who we are 
by having something or somebody that we can point to and say that is who we are not. Yes. It definitely helps to have that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe there is, maybe, maybe that's the glass half full. Yeah, it's probably wrong. Just thinking. No, I like it. It's uh, that's something worth thinking about. Okay. We're just all right. We're just haters, basically. <laughs> yeah, no, we are professional haters. <clears throat> you know, the, it, just like something that's sort of related to this too that I just wanted to touch on really briefly and then move on to the next question is that um, there there are valid concerns in the hobby that not enough attention is paid to people who, and, and not enough light is shined on people who scam or people who have done questionable or bad bad things and that after that happens it gets swept under the rug too quickly and people just want to move on and also you know related to that is there's a lot of concerns about negative content or, or drama right. for the sake of being dramatic and pitting people against each other and stuff and but i think the reason why that attitude exists is because so many people in the hobby you know they they just spend a few hours a week on the hobby or they just, you know, the hobby is supposed to be a fun vacation that they go take in their minds. So, like, they they don't want the hobby to come with the complexities and the, the bad actors and the stress and the negativity that they get in other aspects of their life, whether it's their professional life or maybe their family life or whatever. They don't want that to be in their hobby. So yeah. they have a natural aversion to critical content. Um, they have a natural aversion to, you know, focusing or putting the emphasis or the spotlight on things that are negative or bad or th that we don't like. And I get it. I get why they're like that. But because so much of the community and the audience of sports card content feels that way, it almost feels like there's never going to be an appetite to um, completely, you know, change the way things work. I think the, I think the hobby content landscape is almost always going to be just ripe for the picking for whoever can come in and, you know, show the most followers and the most subscribers and hit the algorithm the hardest. It's always going to be ripe for the taking. I worry. And and every industry it seems right, not just sports cards. Yeah, probably. It's just I I like your point about you know there's just so many people, or probably ourselves included, where it's like, man, we just we came here to take some of our money that we make in our jobs and buy sports cards, and that's it, and just build a collection and sort of like have it be that you know we're buying two by three pieces of paper, you know, it's like how could there be so much drama? Drama, and yet here we are talking about drama. Right. Well, all right. We have one more question on a similar topic, and then we've got some. Then we, then we got a whole bunch of other stuff too. But I, I always like us to like heat up with some of this. Yeah. Stuff yeah. And then we, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got, you've got the show down. You've got the uh, the schedule of this down. There is a little bit of an art to jigsawing <laughs> together the questions. Okay. So Drake's PC chimes in with this. Almost weekly, there's news in the hobby that shifts focus away from cards and collectors, which are the lifeblood of the hobby, from scandals to companies suing each other. It appears that greed is the overriding focus on cards and collectors. While it's hard to make an impact on individuals and their behavior, what more can we do as collectors to take back the hobby that we love? Or do you see these recent events translating into an overall net positive for the hobby over the medium and long term? And we just should ride it out. Is there something specific that he's talking about? Some event? He's got to be. Uh, well, I know he has a later question coming in about uh, the Panini and WWE. Um, mm. you? Right. So, so he's a little bit worried about the future potentially. Sounds like, like it. And it just sounds too like it's. it might frustrate him a little bit that whenever there is something juicy involving feuds of companies or what have you in the hobby, that that's the thing that everybody wants to talk about for the next few hobby news cycles. Did you listen to the Simmons podcast about, uh, about this, where they were kind of talking like the NBA has turned into this 12 month thing where anytime there's downtime, there's not NBA. We've got to create this 
we've got to fill this space with like, oh, Embiid wants out or Lillard's trade is getting closer and closer. And it's just because we've, you know, the NFL's here and we've got this downtime and it's like, we need to get ourselves back in the spotlight. And it feels like anytime we get this lull in the hobby where it's like, oh, it's just, you know, Kimmy pops up and he's just sharing cards and we're just talking about collectors. Like someone's got to like, oh, let me fill this, t- this gap. I got to jump in and I got to sue somebody or I got to, you know, break this contract or I got to shift the whole landscape. Otherwise, you know, what's the, what's the, there's no news, right? It does feel like a little bit of that. that maybe that's part of his question is like, can we just have one month with like consistent collector content and no drama? And I get that, right? It's, it's almost like human nature. Someone has to come in and fill that space with drama. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And at least in the NBA setting, you eventually get to the regular season and the playoffs, and then you get to pivot away from the off-season content. But it can feel like we're just constantly in off-season content mode yeah. compared to the NBA. But um, I don't, I don't know that I would just like say like the all. Maybe it's just an overriding positive. Um, I do think these disputes are interesting. Um, I do think that they raise a number of concerns and I just, I wonder, um, look, this stuff, we, we, this stuff's going to have to play itself out, uh, it through the legal system, because if there are contractual breaches that are going on, then there's justification to terminate those agreements. So we just, we need to see how this plays out. But I, I, <laughs> here's here's the bigger picture thing. I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of people care is that like it's probably not good for the hobby in any term, medium, short, or long, that we might not have licensed football cards for a while. Yeah. Fully licensed. Um, so, or, you know, there's this real, like, card shops don't know if, what they're going to have on their shelves. Yeah. Um, you know, like we had a, Another question come in that I'll just fast forward to now, which uh, asked this from Grip and Rip Cards: When will the NBA shoot drop with respect to the Panini and the right. Fanatics feud? And like I saw Michael Rubin, CEO of Fanatics, posted some content to his Instagram page recently that had Adam Silver was the first picture in the in the carousel of of pictures from this meeting that took place between fanatics and representatives of the NBA. And so the, almost like I inferred a subliminal um, message there to the, to the, to the sports card community to say like, yeah, uh, here we're, we're now going to get the NBA to terminate and move on as well, which would be, mm-hmm. you know, then it's really going to start hitting home for me if I'm not going to have my prison basketball this year. For two years, maybe. Well, let me yeah. take – before I forget and lose my train of thought, I'll take that analogy further. In the discussion with Bill on the podcast, he was – they were getting to the point of saying, like, um, the, the the negativity and the drama, it does create, like, interest and, and media clicks, and, it, and, you know, it gets it – gets, uh, us talking about the NBA year-round, but what it doesn't do, and the person – the the thing that ends up taking the brunt of it is the fan. Like the fan is the one that's like, yeah, this is cool. Like there's more attention to the NBA, but I'm losing Damian Lillard now, or my team doesn't have Joel. And, or as a Sixers fan, I have to go into the season feeling like crap because of all these rumors and all this stuff that like, sure, it garnered interest in the NBA, but like now my team is a disaster. And I, as a fan, I'm suffering that my Sixers are going to suck or they're supposed to suck, or I don't even know what I'm supposed to feel. And it's the same with, with this, where like the collector, you know, the end consumer of these products is the ones that suffer. We're the ones that aren't going to get cards for two years because, you know, these guys want to create interest and, and, you know, figure out how to situate things for themselves and create money and revenue for themselves. And we're the ones that suffer. And it feels similar where, and the whole like Adam Silver fighting for, you know, the players to, to take less rest days and stuff. Like all those discussions are all sort of like, how can we make sure the TV ratings are better so that we can increase revenue for the NBA or as the player, how can I make sure I'm healthier? So I have a longer career. So I make more money, but there's very little thought of like, 
what's better for the me, the, the fan? Like, how do you get me to be happy, right? So that's kind of the parallel here is like, does anyone actually give a shit that I'm not going to have basketball cards for two years? Like, who's going to figure that part out? Like, some, you guys need to be taking a hit in order to make that a reality where we get something for the next two years. Or some, someone make, someone says, like, I don't want to say Panini steps in and says, you know what, we'll just step aside. You can have licenses. That They're not going to do that. But, like, something like that. Or, you know, hey, let's work together and just sort of, like, under understand we've got this awkward two years let's print something let's agree that like we got to print these sets for the fans right something yeah hopefully that will happen but yeah i mean now it's now this stuff is all in the legal system so it's gonna have to work itself out there uh all right next question here from garrett nba this week i saw and this is another longer one as well but just uh, we'll get through it quickly here. He goes, this week I saw an image of a 97 Flair showcase Michael Jordan, which appeared to have gold details. After initially thinking I discovered some ultra rare parallel or a one of one, I actually realized this was just the base version of the card. And it registered as something special since my eyes and my brain have only seen the blue legacy version hundreds of times over the last few years, which begs <laughs> two questions. One, have you experienced something like this? Are rare parallels becoming basically the base version in the way that it registers to collectors' minds? And if so, what are the implications of that? And maybe more importantly, question number two, are 90s collections for us 30-something-year-old dudes all starting to look the same? You choose a player, then you need the PMG, then you need the rubies, then you need the credentials, then you need a flair showcase legacy, and so on and so forth. Will the uniqueness of collections or the way a collection is coordinated make a comeback instead of just piling up as many cards as possible that are re widely regarded as grails? P.S. I can't believe I typed all this out. Man, that was such a good question that I think I just want to like let it simmer for a minute. Like I don't think it needs some clever comment from either of us to be like, oh yeah, it just was like a really well thought out comment. Uh, and it's it's an interesting take because you're, you're right. Like, do we we don't even see people post the base card of these? We're so used to seeing it's like, eh, that's probably the that's probably the PMG red. Like, this guy is not showing a base card on this Instagram post. There's no way. It's probably you know, it's here comes the red, and you're right. Now it's like, uh, you have to show the same ten cards, or do you even collect '90s <laughs> basketball? You know, so it's such an interesting comment. I like it. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting. There, look, this hobby community is. It zags like no other. <laughs> so like, gonna, these cards are going to be better now. So. <laughs> this is the zag of all zags. This, <laughs> this went from uh, the observation that the 97 Flare Showcase with the gold nameplate foil, you know, looks amazing because we don't see it. So now is, is the base really the rare version? <laughs> To, you know, have we all kind of become robotic in the way that we assemble 90s basketball player PCs? And those are really cool and thoughtful, provocative observations. But I'm still going to call this a zag against zagging. This is, this is um, a useful observation. Uh it sort of speaks to the inherent limitations of collecting cards as a whole. Like, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you could have a world where every card's a one of one. Just every <laughs> single card is a one of one, and you never have to see the the same card twice. But there's, you know, you talked about this, Josh, a little bit on the stacking slabs today, sort of about how community builds around a common interest around having a common card and maybe even in player collecting it's even a little bit better because it's like you're not collecting the exact same card but you're collecting a, the same parallels of the same players and sort of going down the checklist i mean sports cards are checklist based after all um so it, it there it does stand to reason that people will approach this sort of from a checklist point of view that yeah you know this is this is the mountaintop card for a 90s uh player pc and so on what do you think about that that to zag against this zag is that maybe it, maybe it's not so bad if there is some uniformity across collections. Yeah, I get that. I was well, I was well. Uh, 
while you were chatting, I was thinking a little bit more about it and I was laughing because it's like, if you really convinced us and this was a really good argument, you and me, for example, and this is, we love this argument. And then he's like, okay, but are you going to go buy the base? And we'd both be like, no, no, absolutely not. I still, it's still got to be serial numbered. You know, it's got to be numbered to 20 or less or otherwise like, no, there's no way. This is, this is a fun argument. Great thought exercise. Nice try. Back to business. Back to my checklist. You know, like we still, to your, what you're asking is like, yes, I still like the uniformity and the checklist nature. I think what I was trying to say on the uh, Brett's podcast was like, in order to have something be rare, you need the unrare thing up against it. Like, you know, you need to have, in order for the the blue one to stand out, it needs to be in a sea of base cards. And that's what always intrigued me about the 90s was like, you know, you'd open 10 boxes of this thing and you'd get the same cards over and over. But when you pull that red one, it stands out so much that it just is like, wow, this is like really catches my eye. But if you get one every box, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't feel the same. And now today we've got so many parallels that you've got you've got many, many different examples and tiers of that sort of experience, right? All the way down to the black finite. So I like having this sort of you've got the one on one and people want the one on one. Some people want like something in the middle where it's more reasonable for them financially, whatever. And then you've got the base card, which stands as this sort of uh like basic for all these other ones to be to be rare against you know what i mean so the zag against the zag for me is like i think it's actually situated kind of perfectly right now yeah that's a that's that's a good zag against the zag i i like that point too that like it's fun to think this through and find and see that there are truths in it but that the conclusion doesn't really change right and uh uh, you know there's there's a critique of social media in here the critique of social media that, that goes back years now, which is that people are only presenting the very best filtered, doctored up perceptions of themselves on social media. Yep. And that, um, and that, you know, this is unrealistic and it leads to displeasure for people like, and this, this is people were thinking back then more about like pictures of you on a beautiful vacation or, your perfect plate of food from the expensive restaurants or your, your amazing rental car that you don't tell anybody is a rental and stuff like that. And so then, but then, then the question, so then it's like, then it becomes, okay, well then people zag against that and they zag into like, well, let me show how imperfect I am. Let let me show how horrible my life is and how stupid I am and ugly and hideous. And like, so like, if, so does this all, do we ultimately go into a hobby landscape on Instagram where I'm just going to open Instagram one day and it's just like, just, just cards ripped in half, just a base card, just demolished. And this is, this is the new hobby. Uh, this is what we start gravitating to. It's like, who can post the shittiest card? Right. And, uh, you know, I don't know. That's like the business model of a stand-up comic. Like you need to shit on yourself the most. Like you need to be the, you know, stupidest stand-up comic. You need to like have that's you know, making fun of yourself is like a the platform for that. So that's the uh, that's the zag into I only post base cards that have been shit on by my dog. <laughs> yeah, and look, I mean, there's going to be some pushback here because like we're colloquially. Um, talking about base cards very negatively because we come from an era of cards where there are a hundred thousand copies of the base card um we this is not a shot at eras of cards where base cards are much more important yeah central to collections uh such as vintage or 80s or even some 90s yeah and this isn't even to totally you know denigrate um, ultra modern base cards either because they have a place and set building has a place and so on and so forth. So let me just say that too. All right. Just anticipating rebuttals as we go here, Josh. Okay. We're, just, we're three steps ahead, you know? We got to be. <laughs> All right. Uh, so there's, nobody even, there's nobody they can even respond. We're like responding to the criti- critical comments we don't even get. Yeah. Exactly. We're, we are seeing ghosts. 
right. <laughs> we're Zach Wilson against the, or what was it? It was Darnold, Sam Darnold. We're seeing ghosts. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's move on here. Bliss Trading Card says, following the Stacking Slabs episodes, I'd love to hear more about the early playing days. I'm sorry. I'd love to hear more about the early days or the early years of how you decided and went about collecting the particular lineups of, of rare parallels that you ended up on. Like, get nerdy. I want all the details. Where <laughs> do you search? How did you find the other parallel collectors? Maybe talk a little bit about budgeting. So take this one where you think, wherever it takes you, Josh. Well, I want to hear how you kind of came to Black Finite because you didn't do that for a while, right? Like I would say it's it's more of like a second half of your collecting career yeah. thing. Whereas I've always kind of been drawn to the gold refractors and it's just, that's always been a constant. So it's kind of, it's going to be interesting to hear you like how you shifted some interested to hear that on the on the uh getting nerdy with it um what i have no idea yeah. on the getting nerdy with it um it was like i just was like trying to find ones that looked cool and you know that's where i started was like just hitting ebay trying to find people that i thought had similar ones asking them where they got them from how you how you decided these are the ones you had building the checklist doing the research of like what are the all what are the possible ones and at that point i didn't even know about cardboard connection so i was just like scanning blowout threads and like searching blowout threads for like the words lebron and gold and just looking for people that had ever posted anything related just to figure out which ones existed and i had seen a picture of the 2005 finest gold lebron at one point and i was like wow that's that to me is like my number one right now because that's the coolest one i've seen visually and it became like my grail chase at the time and I ended up winning one on eBay randomly for like 600 bucks or something. You know, at the time it was cheaper. And then it just, just sort of like, you know, you just, you're in it longer and you just start to find more. And once you start picking up some of the nicer ones and other people message you like, Hey, you're looking, for, are you looking to add one? You're looking to do this one. And then you eventually just kind of know them all, you know? And then, uh, then it becomes like trying to upgrade the grade, trying to get the nicest condition, trying to, get the rookies and just like keep going up and up and then selling the bottom ones. Like it's just like this long thing. So now I want to hear how you came to like the one of one. Cause that wasn't your start. No, it wasn't. And it's not all about one of ones, but uh, I, I just want to comment a little bit on your, what you just said and just kind of like underscore a few things. One of them is that it's, uh, uh, <laughs> for, I think for you, especially um, it, it was natural and obvious and easy how to identify credible sources, how to find the right blowout pages, how to filter mm. and how to know who to trust and who to believe is giving the good information and who isn't because you sort of, you instinctively can suss out credibility from the presentation of the information. You know how to go look at that person back in the day, their flicker or their photo bucket and see what cards were in there and see if the, this person is practicing what they preach and you sort of knew how to evaluate the market for stuff and, and see if what people are saying lines up with prices that are realized like that. There's an art to that stuff too, that like it, it's okay if you make some mistakes there or it takes a little while before you get a, a grip on that naturally. And I think it's harder today than it ever has been to separate the good information from people who are pushing information that just benefits them. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you come? on that for like like if, if you were just trying to start learning about like if you I remember when you did your your deep dive into wide receivers maybe three four years ago if or maybe two or three years ago and like you just went down every rabbit hole you talked to so many collectors you got so much feedback so much input you found the, the classic blow up threads on this stuff you found the collector pages on IG like how did that work? And how would you, go, or more, maybe better question, how would you approach that now, today? Yeah, it's kind of like, um, you know when like you, you need to buy something new and you just it's like, you just like the research part of it more than the actual getting of it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'll spend hours and hours researching Amazon reviews <laughs> and watching YouTube videos of people unboxing them. It's like, you just enjoy that process more. So I think it kind of comes from a place of, I do enjoy that part 
part of it almost more than the the final acquisition part of it. Yeah. So it's like I'm looking for ways. I'm looking for new avenues to where I could force myself to do that research because I actually enjoy it. So that was the receiver. It was like, here's a thing that's interesting to me. I love fantasy football. This seems like something that could really consume a lot of my time and interest just by throwing myself at it. And it's fun to, to um, research, like over-research, basically, like know way too much about it really quickly. And so you get good at, you get good at like, like you said, sussing out what exactly you're looking for and who is like organically going to give you the answers you want quickly. And you can just, you can tell when it's like, yeah, this guy clearly was sent this product and he's getting paid to push it versus like, yeah, this guy knows his stuff. So yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's such key advice. <laughs> to love fall in love with the, the research aspect of it. Um, and if you're not built that way, is like sometimes I can raise my hand and say, I wish I was more that way in, in all aspects. I, Christina and I saw um, Spur Fan at Tech uh, at a Dallas car show like a year or so ago. And he said one of the funniest things to me about like that, that just connected with me about this. So like we were talking and I don't remember the context of it, but basically like we, we started trading stories about when we bought a card and then researched it afterwards and sometimes it like it will work out well you know oh yeah my instincts were good on this one and sometimes you buy a card and you're like like i had an experience where i bought a card that was a gold out of 10 uh that i just was like yeah this card's beautiful it's awesome and then i went and i and then i started like digging into the set and researching it and there were 10 or there were nine other cards that were <laughs> of the same player, also golds, also out of 10, making a big subset. All right. So, you know, sometimes you can get egg on your face doing things that way. Um, but, yeah, like if you're more like me where you just like you want the, like your, your, uh, your process is more just like doing and learning through doing it and bumping your head and stuff and just like taking more risks – you can still learn that way too. It's just you're you're gonna pay a bigger penalty sometimes when you're wrong. But when he because when he said that he said he had some line about it. He was just like, yeah, I've, I've bought cards and then did the research later, plenty of time. As well, that's <laughs> funny to say that because he'll send me pictures of like three cards he picked up and he's like, I didn't really know what I was buying. What do you think of these ones? And I'm like, man, you like one of them was like a he had like a Barry Sanders rubies and it was like. He's like, I've never seen one of these. So he just sort of like used his experience and instinct that was like, I don't, I never see these. Barry Sanders are pretty good. Let me just buy this. I don't know. I, I maybe I overpaid. And what do you think? Like he's asking me after the fact. I'm like, did you just spend a lot of money on that? Shouldn't you have, you know, known? Like the way that I think about it is like, you just bought that, and then it turned out he was completely right. You know, like it, there was like a pot. It only been graded a couple times because some, you know, whatever reason that that one rubies that he had, there was just so few of them. And I was like, yeah, you nailed it. I wouldn't have bought it because I would have been paralyzed by like the fact I couldn't do research in that moment. That's why I don't like these shows. It's like you're putting me in a, a predicament where I have to make this decision without doing research, and you had the instinct to just like buy it, you know? Yep. They're on the 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 right mix or the right place in the continuum of being like totally conservative and closed minded versus being totally open minded and liberally like <laughs> optimized, like. To succeed in the hobby, you know, you can't be just excessively open-minded because then before you know it, you have a thousand top shots and... <laughs> Desmond Ritter. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Before you know it, you just, you can be convinced of anything. You're too open-minded. You can, from the hobby point of view, you, you literally can be too open-minded. But, you give but, the, we have to, uh, before you go, we have, there would be a... a a content or like a meme or something of the guy that owns like every hyped card ever and just like show their collection. You're just like, wow, you bought into literally everything. Look at this guy. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So like you, that's a problem, but you can't be too closed minded or too conservative either, or just everything's going to pass you by and you're just your collection. If you might not even get into the hobby, like you might not even, you, you wouldn't have <laughs> even taken a chance on like an, an alternative uh, collectible or whatever. Like, you wouldn't even take a chance on it because you're just you're too uh, con too worried, too nervous, too conservative. So like you, I think the right 
level on that spectrum is like leaning towards being more open-minded than not, but not being too open-minded that just you walk into a show and just like, Oh, this is pretty. I'll take this. I'll take this. I'll take this. Uh, okay. So this, this relates to the question of, okay, how did I settle on one at once? Well, this speaks to the fact that there's so many different ways to collect based on eras and players in sport. So like, that's why it's almost like we're speaking a different language when we're talking about our collecting philosophies versus people who collect vintage baseball or pre-war baseball or something like that. There, there really are fundamental differences. And for me, I've experienced this sharply because collecting 90s Michael Jordan, I was trained and learned how to collect that stuff by just like trusting my eye, seeing inserts that I thought were cool, you know, going off of it more so instinct and like aesthetics and stuff like that's a big factor of Michael Jordan insert collecting. And then you, you do get into more objective things too, like what's the population report, what were the pack odds, how often does this card sell? And you could start digging into it more and more and start getting more objective. But like Michael Jordan collecting was like more so focused on what are the best looking cards? There's really not that many inserts and there's really not that many playing days parallels available. So it's hard to be wrong um, when you're collecting that stuff. Cause it's just, there's ultimately over the longer run, it's always felt like there's more demand for it than there's supply for it. So that's how I learned how to collect when I first came back. But then when I went into ultra modern, I was able to lean on all that work that you did. I didn't have to do it because when I, when Christina and I finally settled on the first ultra modern player that we wanted to collect, you were just, you gave the sage advice of like, well, here, you know, this is, if you want to build the great cornerstone of a collection, NTRPA 99, Prism Gold, and for basketball, you said Galactic, and for football, you said Cracked Ice. Just get, if you can find those three, you will have built the foundation of a great collection for an ultra modern player. And that was great because I was stumbling in darkness up until you sort of like laid that gauntlet down. Until that point, I was just like, we were just buying blasters of prism and like trying to hit silvers. And we were, you know, looking at sort of like, I, like, I remember I accumulated five or six copies of the Noir Spotlight Signatures Luca, which is a great card, which is a beautiful, beautiful card. Okay. But like, I, you guys had the orange. Yeah, and the prism orange. And like, I was taking the Michael Jordan approach and just importing it straight into ultra modern. And, you know, where it's just like the, the and, it, and it sort of works for like the early, like when only rookie year Luca products were out, you could sort of get away with that because the supply was so limited. But, and this is what I think people don't always think about when Luca's second year products come out, the supply of Luca cards doubles. And then when his third year products come out, now he's got three times as many cards as he had when he was a rookie. And then when his fourth year products come out, you can quadruple the supply relative to the first year. And then you get to the fifth year and then you get to the sixth year and the sea of available options just becomes more and more uh, diluted. And then at that point, you're confronted with the reality that like, you know, this, this, this wasn't happening when I was collecting 90s. They weren't making more of it. But right. when I'm collecting an ultra modern player, more of it keeps on coming every year. I've got to find a way to combat that. Um, and one way that people do that is by focusing on rookie cards, which is great. I, I think that that's a really strong approach. It always has been um, for at least ultra modern players. For, and then that's another thing that Michael Jordan collecting and 90s collecting sort of like conditioned me to not care about rookie cards because for Michael Jordan, the rookie card offering is not really seen by myself and, and others who think like me as the, as the best of his offering. It's just not, uh, we, we like the, the nineties stuff or the exquisite stuff or the, you know, other, like we, there are plenty of cards that, that get, uh, that get more demand, I think, than his rookie offering. So like I had to, there's so many things I had to learn, but ultimately what I settled on was like, you know, in the ultra modern 
landscape, it's so important to me to try and carve out the most, to try and combine the cars that are beautiful with the rarity, with the brand prestige, try and just combine all those things as my collector way of battling against the constantly increasing supply and the just enormous supply, period. And then when you start thinking along those terms, eventually the place that you're going to end up at is like, well, <laughs> why don't I just make a list of the best cards and see how high I can get on it? You know, why don't I just make that list? Why don't I just literally figure out, okay, there's 30 Panini products of 2018 NBA, or roughly that many. What are the 10 best from any of the products? What are the 10 best? And then can I get any of these? Okay, I can't. What are the next? What are the 50 best? How high on that list can I get? And you start, you know, that becomes the logic of ultra modern collecting for, for myself, not necessarily for others, but that's how I approach it. And then when you start thinking that way, all of a sudden, you know, all sorts of different theories on collecting cards come into focus. And then, you know, <laughs> then you end up making it full circle and I come back to now I'm looking at Michael Jordan cards from a whole different light. And now I'm looking at Michael Jordan cards and I'm like, why aren't we talking about these one of ones? Why yeah. are we making top 10 lists and not putting one of ones on? Why are we yeah. doing that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, uh, 1956 Tops guy says, do you maintain a ranking of your cards so that you know what to move when the one pops up? Uh, this is, uh, going to be funny, but this whole, like, Mickey Mantle thing died away in a week, so I can just rip off these takes of hating something, and, and I know it'll go away in a week. You guys just gave me, you just gave me a dangerous tool <laughs> of, like, I can say whatever I want. Dion, who, who knows who's next that's going to get destroyed, and the next week, you guys will forget, 1956 Top Sky proved that, so thank you. Now I can continue on my pattern of just destroying some athlete every week. Uh, yes, I, I do keep the rank. You do as well, right? You just keep the ranking sort of like internally. Is it like a value ranking? It's more of a value ranking for me because I'm always thinking about it, uh, uh, not in a sense of like I'm an investor and I need to know how much money I'm making. It's like when I'm going to buy a new car. Card, I need to know what all my cards are worth so that I know how many I need to pull from the bottom to add this new one on the top. So I kind of rank them by value. I think that's the easiest way to do it. It's just it make that makes it much easier to know exactly how many and you know which, which of the bottom ones you're gonna have to get rid of to get the new one. But yes, that's how I do it. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, you need to. I need to have a, a working knowledge of what the value of every single card in my collection is on an individual basis. So that if I do start eyeballing something that comes up that I want, I know roughly what ones are going to have to go to bring it in. Like you were telling me about this. Talk about this a little bit, Josh. You were talking to me a little bit about how like the, the classic mid-2010s way to collect <laughs> was just keep on accumulating cards and accumulating cards and accumulating cards. And then when the one comes up, then, you know, sell off a bunch of stuff and get the one. Yes. I mean, you and I both did that. Or this, this was like, this was the whole consolidation thing. It, and it worked beautifully in the mid-2010s because we had this slow up and right thing where as you accumulated cards, you knew that when you got ready to sell it in three or four years in the future to replace it with something usually, you know, uh, lower quantity, but something nicer and more expensive, you knew that you could sell those cards for a little bit more than you paid from the years previous. And it just kind of worked out nicely where you had this like 5%, almost like S and P growth of these cards that you'd accumulated, no harm, no foul, sell them, make a little bit, grab the new one, rinse, repeat. You just keep doing that. It got a little tricky when you would buy something in 2020, 2021, you know, and then you tried to do this thing, you try to replay this and it just became like, Oh, this isn't even a thing anymore. We were forced to pivot to cheaper players. Like that whole kind of thing went out the window and we couldn't really do it anymore because now we're selling at these massive losses to replace something that's also 
potentially overpriced and that's going to go down. So we're just sort of like, what do we do now? And it feels like we might be getting back to the point of like, Hey, maybe we could just like go back to the 2015 way of doing it. It's like, let me just go ahead and sell some of these. It's a little more stable right now. Like there's less of these ups and downs. So like, you know that if you buy a bunch of mid to low end ones now, you can kind of like replace them at hopefully close to the same value. You can buy the one that's a little bit more expensive and you don't have to worry about it going in half in a week. So are you, you, you did something and I, I noticed like this kind of feels like what you used to do. So hopefully yeah. that can get you. Yo, it's so funny. So like, let me talk a little bit about this. This is going to annoy the shit out of people because I'm not going to be able to really say, I'm not ready to say what I'm talking about yet, but I'm going to talk around it. <laughs> people are going to be so annoyed because people hate I don't know what thing. I'm allowed to say. You brought it up, but I'm like, am I allowed to say anything? I'll let you do that. Yeah. All right. Let me just do this. So it's so funny too. Cause like when I was going through my mail day, Earlier, like comments were coming in, like, "Oh man, he's not excited about these cards that he's showing. Like these McCaffrey one of ones, he's not excited about." And it's because I have shifted into a new mindset that I'm going to be in for probably a month or two, which is I need to sell some cards to fund a card that I very recently have picked up. And so uh, <laughs> I'm like, now I'm getting, now I'm in a point where I, when I'm looking at my cards, I'm evaluating. Uh, is this card on the chopping block? Like that now, like I'm not seeing these cards, just like these things that have come into the collection. Now I'm seeing them as sort of something that I have to decide if it's going to go or not. So I, I'm taking a much colder look at these cards and at all of them right now. Anything that's in the PCs, uh, with a few exceptions, might be on the chopping block. And so this got me thinking about so, like, I. One card that I sold today, first card I've sold in a long while, was a, a one of my three Christian McCaffrey Prism Gold rookies, and I sold it on eBay, and uh, it was great, you know, because I need to do some fundraising, and that's only going to give me about two percent of the way there, so I just got to keep going. But um, <laughs> I started thinking about it, and I was like, you know, I looked at what I, I sold it on eBay for 1500 bucks, and after fees and stuff, and plus I paid, like, the stupid advertising thing, so, like, I end up getting, like, 1100 <laughs> I end up getting, like, 1100 bucks off of this card when it's all said and done, and I paid 2750 bucks for this card, so I'm locking in this $1,600 loss, and, uh, you know, dude, I, I honestly, like, started... I started thinking about that and I started thinking about how, how many other people out there who like, like I bought this card in the fall of 2021, you know, how many other people out there have bought cards in 2021 and 2022 that they would like to consolidate into a, into a grail, but they don't want to lock in the losses. Yeah. So they're not consolidating right now right. because to do so, you are locking in these losses. Bingo. Yeah. So I'm about to lock in a bunch of losses to move into this new card that I'm very excited about, but that I'm not, I'm not ready to reveal it yet. Like, I haven't paid for it yet. I, I had to move things around so that I could get the funds in the right account to pay for it. So I don't want to talk about it until at least it's been paid for. But uh, yeah, I just I started thinking about that about locking like I'm locking in losses now mm -hmm. to, this, to this new grail. How many other people out there are not are cautious and they're not moving, they're not making moves because they don't want to lock in their losses either. Well, let me uh, make you feel better about that. Uh, let's play out the scenario that you sold that McCaffrey for exactly twenty seven fifty after fees. Let's say just like right after you bought it, and you were doing the same process you're doing today but you didn't have any losses on any of the cards you sold because you sold them much closer to the date that you acquired them you would have taken those funds that you and let's just say you would have gotten double the amount of funds at that time that you did today and you locked in zero losses you have double the funds that you would today the card you are acquiring as the grail would have been twice as expensive back oh, yeah. then so the math ends up kind of being the same and then you would have maybe felt worse because you would have locked in that grail at this, you know, really high price and you've lost all this money on this one card coming forward to today. So it almost feels like the 
these smaller micro losses, these tiny cuts might, might end up being a similar feeling anyways. It, it really ends up just being, uh, as long as you are taking the cards, selling them and moving them into other cards, you should always feel pretty decent about chopping off the stuff in the bottom and adding to the top. If you believe in the, in the hobby long term and your goal is to always just keep accumulating grails, the timing of when you do it kind of doesn't really matter. As long as you know the relativity of what you're moving out and bringing in is similar. Yep. <clears throat> yep, I completely agree. And Someone I, in the chat. Sorry, yeah. one more thing before I forget. 1956 tops guy, the guy who asked the question, did point out. You know, what about this concept of replacing something, like picking cards that are harder to get back in the future? And I wanted to give a little bit of a spotlight to that because we just pointed out, like, hey, you just rank them by value, and if there's like a tie break scenario on value that you need to replace, maybe go for the one, if you are planning to get it back in the future, definitely pick the one that's like uh, easier to get back. You know, like the, don't sell the one of one, sell the gold prism because you have dupes or you, you feel like it'll be easier to get that than the one of one or something like that. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, no, that's a factor too. Um, I'd, I'd be more to sell a higher value card that it was that was easier to get back than a lower value card that would be harder to get back. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then, you know, you need to... But I, I am here to preach the gospel of consolidation once more. <laughs> because... And, and to do, like... My style of consolidation involves waiting until the very last second... Like uh, so, there is a there is a great so uh, Rusillo's earlier podcast this week had the the guy Big Cat from Barstool on, and the and Big Cat was nervous coming out of the show because he's like Ryan, you know, you have a more highbrow audience, and I just do everything off of vibes, right? And like I definitely, despite how much I would like to make myself be a very very rational thinker when it comes to cards. I do so much off of vibes when it comes to cards. Yeah. So much vibes, especially curating my collection. It's very vibey. Yeah. And no advanced analytics, just vibes. And so when, you know, when I'm like bidding on a card like this one that this new one that's coming in and you were like, what, what's your max? And I'm like, dude, I won't know what my max is until, <laughs> until that auction ends. <laughs> I just don't know. Me, me and Christina were sitting here bidding on that card, just like yeah. going back and yeah. forth so many times, like, oh, we're done, we're out. And then Christina and Christina is the is the the Christina is the, the real influencer because she, <laughs> she's just like, go more, go more. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, but but what why I wanted where I was going with this is um doing this has forced me to clean up the clutter. Yeah. Doing this has forced me to say, yeah, man, I need to turn a page in my collection. Like, and collections are always evolving. You know, just, you're always finding new ways to think about things and learning things and taking new approaches and refining your approach. Or I don't know if it's being refined, but evolving or changing. And I, you know, that's the thing about like when I'm, I, I don't put a bunch of thought into this. I just, <laughs> I don't put a bunch of thought. I just, uh, I, I just, I, I have never won a card on PWCC Premier. They've been doing it for two and a half years. Only one card has ever spoken to me in such a fashion that I decided that I wanted to go after it and get it. And then, and then I didn't, you know. And then after I get it, I'm like, like as I'm bidding at the end, I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm gonna have to figure out what cards I want to sell now, you know. Yeah. So, like, you know, that's – even when I was doing this four or five years ago, you know, like, I would wait until that grail became available, and then I would buy it, and then I would be like, oh, shit, I need to do – I need to sell $20,000 worth of Jordans in 48 hours. <laughs> you know, that's just – that's always how I roll. Well, the, I'll come circle it back to um, – it's nice to be able to just – you know, have this consolidation option where you could just sell stuff, take the funds, no matter at what point you're doing it and put it into a grill. Cause there's been so many times where I'm like, you know, I always, I always come to you with like, Hey, what do you think about this? Should I, and it's like, ultimately it's my decision. 
I know more about what I'm buying than you do anyway. Same for when you ask me my opinion, but it's nice to bounce ideas. And when I see some of the stuff that you pick up sometimes, I'm like, oh my gosh, just get the, just stop buying the 10 whatevers and buy the one awesome one that I know you want anyways. Yep. And then at two years later, you do it and you're like, oh yes. And then you, it's like the, it's like the, you had fun buying all those ones along the way. You got to enjoy the mail days. I was wrong anyways, because you still were able to turn those into the grill you wanted. And we're both right. And it just ends up being this amazing thing in the, in this hobby hobby that we all get to enjoy where it's like you get the mail days you get the cards you want you get the random one-on-ones you get the learn new products and then you still end up with the grill yep yeah brett calls them little dopamine hits like little hundred dollar mail days here and there in between the the monster pickups yep. yeah they they do something they do they they count for something what if you just like only bought one card a year yeah, that that just wouldn't be right. And you have like, <laughs> you've got like, very like fifteen just like perfectly situated grails that are all in PSA ten. It's just like this very neatly organized collection that has no no fluff whatsoever. And you just you you save your salary at the end of the year. You buy the best one you can or whatever. That that's just no fun. It's not. And you know, uh, you also never know when that one card is going to become available, if it ever is going to become available. Right. So you could set yourself up for like a worst case scenario where like you haven't been buying any cards, you've been saving this little nest egg of money up that is losing money rapidly due to inflation. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, a year, two, three, four years go by and the the card that you're looking for just never appears, and then you didn't, and then it's the worst of both worlds because you don't get the grail, and you don't, you didn't get to enjoy collecting cards along the way either. So like maybe it's a decent hedge to like yeah. pick up cards along the way, and then just you know you know that you're signing yourself up for a lot of work when it comes time to sell, them. and and some like agony, you know, some agonizing decision making about which ones do I let go and yeah, you know. Is it the right timing to sell this one right now and stuff like takes effort and stuff that, that wouldn't necessarily appear to be so uh, stressful. But the risk, though, is, is that if you had spent two years buying Zion Williamson cards and then all of a sudden you want to sell them and buy a Michael Jordan, it's like, well, that probably didn't work out very well. Good point. That can go <laughs> wrong too. That can go. That can go wrong too. And like. <clears throat> I would worry, like, uh, you can, or you can backdoor into, like, the wrong card by just, like, having been very disciplined all year, and then you're like, all right, man, whatever's coming up on this next golden auction, like, I'm getting a grail. And <laughs> yeah. It, and it just isn't the right grail. Yeah. You know, it's just not in there. Um, so, but, yeah. There is no right way to do it, man. There are going to be, there are pitfalls along every path. All right. Uh... uh Let's go to this card. Bleecker Street Cards. I'm so glad we get a question like this again. It's been like years. <clears throat> Bleecker Street Cards Favorite, is... Favorite 90s insert. <laughs> no, we've got a lot of those uh, lately. Maybe. You get a $1 million hobby gift card. What cards are you buying? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, uh... Well, I need more. I need more clarification here because I just would like buy my own collection back. Am I? Do I have my current collection and I'm 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 forced to acquire new stuff? <laughs> yeah, let's just say that this. Yeah, yeah. This is what's next. You know, assuming you already have what you have. Okay. I would just go, go ham on like what I have, what I've been doing lately, and just like be more aggressive and pick up more of them and get get more LeBron exquisites and stuff. I just. I'm just so focused on that right now that I can't envision myself breaking from that. Isn't that, I don't know. Like I can't, I'm, I, I'm not going to give you like this, like, Oh, here's like the most underrated, you know, I would buy this at this timing wise. And like, you know, Zion's underrated right now because he's so down and this is a good time. I would, I wouldn't do that. I would just buy more collector cards that I'm after. Do you remember when we were at the Mint collective and you, Justin and I did a panel and there was a guy towards the end. 
Yes. Said, how would you spend the million dollars? You know, and it's always like, it's, it's always, um, this is always a very dangerous question because it can easily slip into like investing in advice. But I like the way that you put it. You're like, hey, from my collection, for what I like, based on what I already have, this is what I would do, you know. And and then it's also a dangerous question because you don't, you know, as a collector, I don't want to give somebody an idea that I might <laughs> want to pursue one day <laughs> before I pursue it. You know, I don't want to do that. So, but I do. But I thought about this question. I thought about those angles to it. But I think I do have an an answer I can give to this question. Oh, this, is a, this is a tricky, tricky question. And I remember, like, when we used to, like, a question of this variety would come up, like, two or three times a week, like, during the peak of the peak, you know? And we would we would always just be like, stop asking for investment advice. But I, I don't think that this person is doing that. Though. I think this person just wants us to have fun and answer this question. Agreed. But uh, here, here's what I would do. With a million bucks... Um, and this, this is not, not, this is why my answer is so great because this, this would never happen. This is unrealistic. It's not possible. So, but it, since we're in a fantasy world, I would take that million bucks and I would go try to buy. Uh, Jordan, one of. Yes, one of Nat's. I would go to Nat and I would try to buy his Row 2 97 Flair Showcase <laughs> Masterpiece one of, like his worst one. Because, like, the Row 3 is the, ba- is the, is the true base which he doesn't have, and he said it's never been seen, or at least he's never seen it. But he does have the row zero, the row one, and the row two. The row zero is very iconic. People love the 97 Flare row zero. It's the uh, horizontal one with the mojo pattern. And the row one is arguably the most beautiful of all the flares and of ni- from 97. And, but then the row two is just kind of like, this is the lowest guy on that four-card hierarchy. Because he also has the 98 Ultra Purple one of one masterpiece too. So I would just try and see if there would be a way that I could pry out. You just slide in there and just see if I could get the worst one. Now, honestly, I think that – I don't know what that card is worth. A million dollars probably isn't getting it done. But this is my fantasy world. I would want to go in there, and that's that's what I would do. I would try to make that move. Remember we were talking about? earlier about the ability to like suss out people who are truthful and organic and what they're buying and what they're saying and stuff like that. This would be such a great, uh, a great question to like, like really figure that out. You ask somebody and if their answer is like, Oh, I'd buy like a PSA 10 Jordan Fleer, you know, <laughs> I, I think you could buy right now. Or if they said, basically you look at their Instagram page and it lines up with exactly their answer. It's like, yeah, this guy collects Jordan. He collects one of ones He clearly values this. And he's just going to go get like the best of that. Cause you gave him the opportunity to fast track it. He just, that's what he wants. So I just feel like that answer is like, yeah, if you listen to the show more than five minutes, you know, Chris is obsessed with one of ones and Michael Jordan's his favorite, you know, player. It's like, he's probably going to go get a one-on-one Michael Jordan. <laughs> it's like, I need to do it before we get to it. Yep, we're not breaking news with that take. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, for Mad City Collector, this is a, I'm, I'm thinking this is kind of a follow-on from your interview with Brett. He says, what parallels will you chase, if any, when Tops starts making basketball and football cards? Did you hear what I said about gold parallels if they came out today? Yes, I did. I would not a, like them. It was a nuance and a good point, which is that some – I like how you said, like, look, when a gold, if a gold parallel out of a brand-new product comes out and there's 50 copies, 40 of them will be pulled in breaks and or make their way to eBay. So like there could be so many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you figure, like, I think I've seen seven of the ten – Old Prism LeBrons from this current one, like the newest year, it's like seventy percent. So I can just kind of assume like thirty-five to forty are just going to be P- BGS nine fives or PSA tens immediately, and that just wouldn't interest me. And the only reason I collect the fifties is because the era is old enough, and like the the timing at which people bought those cards aligned with like the fact that they're kind of scarce and they're hard to find. But today they just wouldn't be. So I would go for super fractures. I would be like, I'd like give me the super fracture of 
of LeBron. Like if I can't get that, I'll just kind of give up and move on to the next year. Or maybe if there's a, if they make some sort of like red out of five, you know, I might go for that or something, but I, you know, or I would get like the, I would like be the guy to chase the optic uh, gold final or, you know, the equivalent or whatever. Like maybe they have a finest, it's like not the, the tops Chrome super factor, like the one that everyone's going for, but like the, the secondary one. Yeah. yeah. No, it's going to take a long time, I think, to figure out what the brands are and which ones are going to have the parallels and, and or inserts or whatever that, uh, you know, that, that we want to chase. Like, yeah, we just, it's so hard to, to know what I, those points are great. I, I really hope that, uh, there's going to be a mind towards um, capturing the magic of the consistent out of 10 parallel, because that seems to be the right number. They won't. Yeah. Because it's like, they would have done it for wrestling. Why would it, you know, they would have done it for baseball, but they didn't. Yep. That, that's a good point. So we're just going to have to see how that's going to work out. Uh Hudson Cards 35 says, what is your favorite one of one parallel? Not in your collection, just in general. Is it Super Fractor, Black Finite, Gold Vinyl, etc.? Mm. What's yours? Uh, uh, Black Finite. Yeah. So, like, the football one. Yes. I, I have tried to push this agenda for years, that the Black Finite is more beautiful than the true black. It is. I think, I think it is too, but like I'll run the poll and like the true black will always win yeah. by you know. Well, if the it's like I I equate it to the super fractor because the super fractor has the unique color, but it also has the extra thing with the swirls, and the black finite has the unique color and it's got the thing to it. Yep. So it like it it's like you have the five out of five, the out of ten, they all are just like the more premium. Brett used that word a lot, and I'm going to use it now. The more premium parallel as you move up, and it gets off, but the one-on-one needs to be like, not only does it need to be the premium color, it also needs to be in my face that this is the one-on-one. It's like, wow, that thing is definitely the one-on-one. That thing is so unique. That's why I like the Super Fracture for the same answer, or the same reasoning as your answer, is like, you know that thing's the one-on-one just looking at it, you know? Yep. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I couldn't agree more. So is that your vote, the super? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so. The the logo man autos are cool though. Just wanted to give a little shout out to yep. that. Yep, and uh, in no category is the patch auto one of one, especially if it's the shield. Is it more cherished than football? Like the irony of the black finite being the most beautiful prism parallel and only belonging to football is that football seems to revere the shield autograph one of one from the super high end products more than the black finite, <laughs> which is, you know, like, why couldn't you just give us the black finite in basketball then? And, you know, but uh, football has always gotten the football has always been just a little bit better in the Panini era. The car, the football cars have always been a little bit better. Uh, yeah, so, all right. Uh, Preston's card, shout out to Preston, says, how much does a PSA 10 help a black finite or a superfractor mm. when we see some grading sixes or sevens? I always love this question because the, the first instinct of a lot of people is like, oh, it's a one-on-one, who cares what it grades? I love a, a PSA 10 of these one-on-ones. I think it's so cool. Remember when that LeBron 04 Super Fractor sold a few years ago? Remember that? And it was a PSA 10, and I just was like, oh my god, a PSA 10 of the second year LeBron Topps Chrome Super. What an amazing card. If that card was a PSA 5, I would have thought less of it. I just would have. Like, I just, the PSA 10 just really is like, wow, holy crap, that really makes it and the, like the Trevor Lawrence Black Finite rookie, a PSA six, kind of like, it's cool. It's the one hundred and one, but it, how much cooler would it have been if it was a PSA ten? Way cooler, without a doubt. Without a doubt, it's way cooler. Um, if I could just kind 
want to like break this down to basics for a second. The, the technical grade is assessing the condition of the card. And the condition of the card normally is related to its eye appeal, to how nice it looks. Okay, so generally speaking, if a card is a low grade, there's some there's something impairing its presentation. Maybe edge wear and corner damage, maybe a surface scratch, maybe a crease. There's something preventing this card from having a perfectly clean presentation. So, you know, if we kind of like break it down to the basics of like, well, why would a 10 be more um, desired than a five when it's a one of one? Well, probably because the fact that it's a 10 is symbolizing that the condition is outstanding. Yeah. And outstanding condition has, has seen, you know, it, hasn't that always been important? Has, haven't we <laughs> always wanted our cards to be in good condition as opposed to poor in most situations? Yeah, I love that you brought this up because in the last few years, the, the grading has been kind of skewed because our brains are like, you know, condition for value, condition for value, resell, the politics of the PSA 10 versus the BGS 9. There's just all this stuff that goes on. And it's like the whole point of this was just to which cards look better. And it was like a, it's supposed to be this unbiased third party system that helps us decide as collectors, which ones look better for us to have in our collections. And it's a nice reminder that like, that's ultimately what we should use grading for. But instead I feel like we've bastardized it myself included. Like I couldn't even, that didn't even cross my mind. It's like, no, I just, I want the prestige of having the PSA 10, like some dingus, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, from Drake's PC. On Wednesday's Stacking Slabs podcast, Brett talked about supporting small businesses in the hobby. I strive to try and support small businesses, but I sometimes feel forced to use the big auction houses or online platforms because a card I want is located there. Yep. What advice do you have for the hobby to encourage more small business like direct buying, selling, trading of cards and related hobby essentials? What a what a fantastic rant by Brett. Did you listen to that episode? Yeah, and he, and he put it at the it's at the end. Yeah, you know, I, I was just waiting the whole episode to like get to the the episode title, and then it was worth the wait. I DM'd him and I was like, like, let this man cook. He was cooking, <laughs> man. He was just going to town. He was he was the chef of the day. Uh, I feel like we should send uh, Brett an invoice. He's been getting a lot of uh, free publicity on the show tonight. <laughs> Send that man an invoice. Yeah. Just kidding. Um, I think he made a great point where he was talking about, and this is my answer. He was talking about how, like, you know, if you really, like, like dig into the math of how much money you make on these platforms and stuff, it it, it ends up being pretty marginal. Um, and so the way that he decides to do it is basically, like, going with his favorite either like his friend or like a, the best customer experience that he gets from it. Like what gives him the best vibes from the, ex, from the experience of buying or selling from these platforms. And he just is going off that and he figures in the long run, you know, I may, I may lose a thousand bucks total or whatever, you know, like some small percentage of my total collection that I will never look back and be like, man, I wish I had that extra thousand bucks right now versus like, man, I spent 10 years of my career collecting career, building this amazing friendship, supporting this business that means a lot to me. He's getting way more value in his personal life, you know, in the long run by making that decision versus the short term sort of like, Oh, I made a hundred bucks extra. And so I think that's the way to do it is like, put yourself in the uh, thoughts of like, how do I make this uh, better for myself in the long run? Great. Great point. And I'll build off of that point and say that there are, also many situations where the small boutique hobby business is giving you a better service and more value than the big conglomerate is. So in those situations, the effort needs to be made to like find and identify those small businesses because they're not nearly as visible, but they are out there. And then once you do find them, you will find yourself in a better situation you will have you will you you may have uh, saved the most on fees, or had access to the largest network, 
of relevant people or just had a better customer experience by going that route. Because, like, there's sort of, like, this um, assumption, I think, sort of in American culture where, like, the mom and pop versus the big corporation and the idea is, like, yeah, the mom and pop costs more because it can't be done at scale right. and stuff, but, like, support it to support the local. But I don't even think that's always true in the hobby situation. I think a lot of times the small business ends up pro- – ends up just it, it might not be at scale but it can end up providing you with with a lot of value uh, or they could be they could be cheaper because they don't have a marketing budget or like they don't exactly. have like marketing overhead exactly okay um all right let's go to this one lsu tiger collector 65 big fan of the shit beast <laughs> i noticed a lot of influencers post inspirational messages. What would your inspirational message be for the hobby? Man, my inspirational. So this is like my own my own twist on what inspiration actually. What does inspiration mean, Chris? Is it does it have to be positive? You know, do I do I need to do I need to inspire others to do something positive? I don't think I do. Who are two of the greatest? Okay, so I just watched this Twitter thing right before the show. This, this, this fucking influencer content. Got <laughs> me. And it was a Tom Brady one-minute clip. And he's on a stage. And he, he's, like, looking younger than he is now. I'm not sure when it was from. And he's just like, he's like, I had no friends on the football field. He's like, the other team was the enemy. And the only friends I had were the guys who were in the battle with me. And I hated everybody else, and I just wanted people to hate me and to say something. Just, just give me that little extra motivation, and you know, just put me in the right mindset to want to go out there and just absolutely destroy everybody. And then you also have like the Michael Jordan Last Dance stuff, which is of a similar nature. So to your point, you can, you don't have to be positive to motivate. In fact, two of the greatest, most motivated competitors of our lifetimes in sports got motivated by pure negativity. <laughs> pure negativity. I mean, that's what I was going to say is like, I'm looking for, I'm looking for like either doubt, like those guys, like you're saying there, like, uh, cause MJ's was basically like, how dare you, you know, how, how dare you like insult me with your peasants? Like I'll destroy these guys. Um, but yeah, it's like I just go negative. Like, what's overrated? Who sucks? Who can I go after? Like, what's the uh, what's the inspiration I can give you to like destroy everybody else? So here's gonna be the inspirational message: uh, Your collection sucks. <laughs> <laughs> your collection is the Gary Payton of the world. <laughs> your collection sucks. Your content is trash. And it, that's what inspires me personally. When you're like, Dude, that inspires the greats. That's how we. When that's you're like, how you inspire a hobby. You're like, you're not gonna get an iPhone. You're gonna stick with Android. You're too. You you just you gotta be too different. And I'm like, ah, oh, god damn it, you fucker. <laughs> it's like, why I have an Android? Because I don't want to be the guy that conforms, and everyone's got the stupid iPhones, and we're all just conform forming to all having the same thing drives me nuts but so we're in this era of like ultra positive influencer content like wake up and do it you're never too old uh you know just grind incessantly (laughs) which is the word grind is we got to find a new word that just that means like it's too many things i don't like it I have to grind incessantly against what? Well, look, let's let's jump out ahead of this <laughs> let's jump ahead of this curve and let's zag into the the era of negative influencer content. <laughs> I've been doing it for two weeks. I'm waiting for <laughs> <laughs> Mickey Mantle suck. I'm waiting for Lamine to do the Grim Reaper thing with like a Mickey Mantle, a Deion Sanders, and a John Stockton on the doors. I'm waiting. Well, Jose was asking me before the show, who's up next on your list? Right. Yeah. It's like next Thursday, next Thursday, 
tune in. We'll find it's whatever you you end up texting me something where I'm just like, fuck this, that that sucks. I'm gonna destroy that right now in my stories. <laughs> like, oh, Colorado's looking pretty good. No, no trash. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, who's next? Do you have an idea yet, or because there's so much? You're you're like buying real estate in, you know, you're buying prime real estate, beachfront property in the town of Hate. Yeah. And it's it's like uh, you're just ahead of the. Curve. I'm, in like, I'm in like the middle of like I don't want to I don't want to speak negatively on any areas, so that would be bad. <laughs> But like an area that no one else wants to be in in the middle of summer, you know, it's humid, it's hot. That's where I want my real estate. Let's just, let's get in there. Let's grind. <laughs> nice. Against war. Right. Um, collect the grind incessantly. I, that's my, that's going to be my favorite. If you, I hope I, you wrote that one down. I have to grind incessantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I just love the word have to. You're like, God damn it. I watched Gary and I just have to. It sucks. I don't even want to. All right. Uh, from Collectogram, who is the best rookie quarterback to invest in? Oh, my goodness. He's going. He's, he's just going right at it. He's just like, give me the name. I don't even care. Give me the name. And there was a laughing emoji with this. Okay, good. Um, I'm hearing. CJ Stroud is pretty good. That's that's the chatter right now. Well, the thing that yeah, that's that is the chatter. Two games in. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Against uh, the Colts. Going two as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Collectogram. He used the word invest, and that's what makes this question like. A a very specific question because investing is the idea of to dumb it down. I mean, I mean, people take issue even with using the word invest because it has more of a technical meaning. Maybe speculation is a better word, but who, who is the best to invest in? Well, it can't be any of the guys who have already shown themselves to be good. Right. Because there's already, we know how this market works. There's already so much built into that. Yeah. That, you know, I mean, maybe if your time horizon of investing is a week, maybe you can get lucky. And You need the Mahomes sitting out a year kind of scenario, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, even then, you know, even then, like, like you, if you pick the right guy, who wins MVPs and Super Bowls over and over again? It doesn't matter. You know, you're in years. What 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 year is Mahomes in? He's in 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. He's in his seventh season, sixth season as a starter. Right. He's done everything you could possibly hope. Five AFC championships. And he gets his market has like gotten slaughtered. <laughs> okay. Now like. It is doing well over the last month, all right, as men, as, as several are. But, you know, from the peak, um, so, like, when the, when the question is invest, Josh, you, I, what, what can you do, right? Like, how can you <laughs> – it, it doesn't seem feasible that you can say, hey, I, found, I watched two weeks. I know it's a little bit early, but, like, this, this rookie quarterback looks good. It's too late. There, by that time, so much speculation and hype is baked in. Yeah. So. So no, right. None of them. That's your answer? None. Yeah. Will Levels? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess. He probably has a lot of speculation built in, too, though. You know? like. Here's one question. Do any of these guys even have rookie cards yet? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I uh, I don't think there are many, if any, rookies for a lot of these guys right now. I don't know. There probably are some. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let me let me get Vinny's question in. We always try to get his in when we can. Vinny Slabrino 
As always, enjoy the show. There are not an endless amount of PSA 10 80s baseball rookies that you can just oh, rack man. out and get autographed, <laughs> hoping for a 10-10 grade. What happens when so many of them get cracked that the non-autographed 10s become more scarce than the autographed versions? You can't just find more 10s to autograph because the idea of junk wax is a false label for 80s baseball cards that's been pushed by uninformed hobby talking heads. And then he go, he says, great discussion with Ken this week. I went on a podcast with um, Sports Card Lessons, Big Ken, who uh, we kind of talked about like the rise in Cal Ripken prices that happened over the summer. And uh, I think Vinny's kind of responding to that. And Vinny said, he says, thanks, Vinny. So what do you think about this, Josh? So he's saying so many people are jumping into this fad of uh, getting IP autos of this stuff that it actually the base cards will be more they- rare. It could be because okay, so the Cal Ripken, interesting. Um, the Cal, especially the high grade, especially the yeah. high grade stuff, right? Yeah. So the Cal Ripken eighty-two tops traded PSA ten has a population of four hundred and eight. <laughs> That's kind of high. I, maybe this isn't exactly the one he's referring to, but but this card was um, consistently around four to five thousand uh, dollars throughout the first half of this year. And all of last year. Show the card. And then, and then suddenly this summer, um, the card has leapt in value to. Here, let me pull up like a two year. Oh. So this summer, the card jumped up in value. It got as high as $10,500. Whoa. You know, after having been in the four to $5,000 range. So the, the card, you know, doubled in value over the summer. And I had no idea why, but the sales looked good. And, you know, I started asking around and a few people told me like, well, this might deal with the fact that Ripken's been doing some in-person autograph signings. And with the recent explosion of IP autos on rookie cards, gaining some traction and creating this like new category of cards that some people are finding interesting, that people are taking these PSA 10s, very carefully cracking them out having Ripken sign them and then try to get them back into PSA 10 slabs, but with a 10 autograph too. Mm-hmm. And so, like, and so that was the theory yeah. behind what's driving the rise in price and the demand and the rise in demand for this card was that multiple people are trying to do that. Only point out a flaw in this line of thinking though, this is assuming that the market accepts that the population of these graded cards is lower, but we don't have actually any data to support it and any tracking because people aren't sending their flips in to have it removed from the population in the vast majority of cases. So the pop is staying the same, but the scarcity is increasing, right? Like you're having less supply come to market. Less of these are selling as PSA tens because more are being cracked, but there is still this like, uh, reality that people are going to the pop reports and saying, hey, it hasn't changed. It's still 400. It's still not super rare. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that makes it very tricky <laughs> that uh, we, won't, we won't be able to know what the number of remaining PSA 10s are, but I guess you can sort of get a feel of it from the float and how many are available versus how you know, how many ones were available. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting comment there, Vinny. And like baseball card promotion says in the chat that 402 or 408 uh, PSA 10s is a very low number, not high. So, you know, that's from the perspective of um, 1982 tops traded, you know, which yeah. like that's a, that's a very different era with far fewer products you know, um, and etc. Et so, all right, uh, we are at the two-hour mark. So, lots of good questions we didn't quite get to, but that's all right. Dan, <laughs> before you do the titles, I have an update. TV show. Let's get. We got. We got to bring back a little TV show yeah. content. I have a new show. Show. And I'm watching. I think the audience will enjoy, and I think you, you would also enjoy. Right. It's called The Bear. Have you heard of this show? Like a kitchen? It's about a kitchen. 
but it's more about like the characters and the drama than the actual technical, you know, chef food part of it. That is that's definitely the 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 plot, but it is a very, very good show. And it's super short. Episodes are thirty minutes. I think it's completed season two, I believe, and it's very good. All right. <clears throat> Write that down in your notes. The bear. I'm I'm I am unwilling and unable to commit to any new uh, TV programming because in one month and one day the NBA season is back on and that's two to three hours of content per day. Yep. So I, We're going to finish the bear in a week though. It's it's short. We're going to finish okay, it in a okay. week. All right. All right. Well, maybe I'll try to squeeze it in then. You got a little, you got a short window. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I was like, we weren't going to start it and I'm I was like, these episodes are only 30 minutes and it's only two seasons and it's like eight per season? Yeah, we could, we could knock this out. It's got to be better than watching the Bears on Sunday. <laughs> Cardinals and the Bears, man. We might have the two worst teams in the NFL. Yeah. that's They're competing for that right now. And I think we are the worst, actually. But uh, I would prefer to be worse than you because I really like Caleb Williams. So why don't you just calm down, guy? Okay? Well, look, then you got to remember this. The Panthers are throwing their hat in the ring for the worst as well. <laughs> Bryce Young sucks, apparently. <laughs> it's been two weeks, so we know who sucks and who's good. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the Bears own the Panthers' first-round pick next year. Well, the Cardinals own the Texans' first-round pick, so I see wow. your little game, and I raise you the Texans. So are you tell- telling me the Cardinals and the Bears are going to be drafting the first four picks next year, basically? <laughs> That is correct, sir. Dude, are you kidding me? The only thing that Cardinals fans have talked about at all over the last two months is, are we getting Caleb Williams and Marvin and Marvin Harrison Jr.? <laughs> and of course, now I'm realizing Bears fans are probably now starting to say the same yeah. things. Well, look, Bears fans, we don't wish any good quarterback to come to our franchise. <laughs> because they're... Talk about setting somebody up for failure. They'll just ruin their lives. <laughs> yeah. Yet Stiff has even gone so far as to say if Patrick Mahomes had been drafted by the Bears. I mean, Andy Reid's pretty good. He is good. He, that's that's still such an underrated aspect of uh, quarterback yeah. success. Is the how many of the great quarterbacks of the of the last five to six years just so happened to join? Basically, playoff teams are close. To so playoff. let me get this straight. Hold on a second. Let me let's pause for one second. If Brock Purdy was on the Bears, what are we looking at here? What are we What are we talking about? This is like the antithesis of the Niners. What are we? Am I dealing with eleven and zero, or is this you know is this worse? Dude, if Brock Purdy was on the Bears. <laughs> he he'd be he'd be playing rugby in Australia. He'd be so <laughs> far out of the league. The Shanghai Dragon. <laughs> yeah, he would be I, – and I don't even want to offend, you know, the rugby players. <laughs> He's, he'd be uh, he'd be backing up the, the Johnny lowest Manziel. NFL quarterback. Yeah. Like he, he'd be Johnny Manziel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would uh, – dude, the Bears is just – it's a doomed franchise, especially for quarterbacks and wide receivers. Um, Justin Jefferson has more wide receiver, has fun. more receiving yeah. Yeah, than anybody. <laughs> I was like, what? Brandon Marshall was pretty good there for a little while. He couldn't have racked up more than four seasons of yards. Come on. And DJ Moore has the most receiving yards of any Bears wide receiver, any, any receiver to put on a Bears uniform. And he came into the league in 2018. Mark said. Says Purdy would be serving pizza at Lou Malnati's. <laughs> he wouldn't even be serving. He'd be bussing. <laughs> He'd be cleaning the dishes in the back. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's let's pick a title. All right. <clears throat> Up first, embracing your baldness. <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit too too forward mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Yep. It doesn't touch on one of the central themes of the show. Plus, like, 
this the picture you choose is like just us staring at the screen and it's like all right come on we see the picture yeah exactly so it's implied okay uh he's in the dead zone what is that mm-hmm. the dead zone i don't remember uh one giant influencer <laughs> 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 That's what? referring to uh, Dion. Oh my god, he's just like a mega, like a big, like a physically big influencer, like a giant human. It would make for a good uh, image, just a, just like tiny us and this huge Dion Sanders influencer. Oh, those big sunglasses. <laughs> he was we, on an interview, and we have on like his uh, his sunglasses too. He was on an interview, and he like. You know, he's handing these stupid sunglasses out to people and he's shilling for it. He looks over at his, like, PR person or whoever goes, what's the brand of these sunglasses again? It's like, are you, are you fucking serious? You've been wearing these things for a year. You won't stop talking about it. You don't even know the name of the fucking company. Idiot. <clears throat> Come on, Dion. Okay. Time to put this guy in his place. <laughs> I cannot root for an influencer. <laughs> These are all just Dion ones. Yeah, this, this is the Dion section. Okay. Um, invisible enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, uh, Zags like okay. So there's three variations on the Zag. Zags like no other. Zag of all Zags. Zag against the Zag. Zag the Zag. Okay. Um, I'm just going to circle Zag against the Zag. I kind of like that one. All right. We are seeing ghosts. (laughs) 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 Uh, (laughs) Um, We have uh, gave me a dangerous tool. (laughs) What what is that? That You you were talking about, uh, damn it, that was something you said that gave me a dangerous tool. Um, oh, it was, it was like the vintage guy asking me a question that wasn't following up on my hate for Mantle. Right, right. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, lock in the losses. <laughs> <laughs> um, tricky, tricky question. Christina is the real influencer. She's influencing you to spend more money. Yes, she is. Uh, in <clears throat> influencer content got to me. Because I asked you, are you done bidding? And you're like, yeah. And then I thought I was. I really an hour later it went thirty percent higher, and you won. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was. Then Christina came in. Uh, right. Chef of the day. Um. I have to grind incessantly. That's the winner. And uh, send Brett an invoice. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, too. Okay. I just want to know, do you know how to spell incessantly without looking it up right now? I, I do not. I don't either. I'd be, like, Googling it to make sure I spelled that right. Yeah, we'll make sure that that's spelled correctly. Is that yours? I don't want to force that one. That's just my fave. We no, that's good. Yeah, that's good. We we had a few good ones this week, but that one ties together a lot of different things. Like the, it, there's been this there was an influencer thing at the beginning with Dion, and then it turned into hobby content influencers, and then it came back to Christina as the real influencer. So, which is weird because. We we rarely talk about influencers, you know. It's like a rare theme. We never do that. We are not critical of the influencers. Are you gonna do half in all caps? No. Okay. Well, I think maybe I have to grind incessantly. Okay. All right. I kind of see like stylizing the half. So you're saying all caps have, and then lowercase everything else. You don't have to. Just I'm picturing it. I'm go, I'm, I'm, work, I'm workshopping it. I'm looking at how it, I'm looking at how it looks. Yeah, live, live with it for a second. And then I'll surprise you with which way I go. That's I mean, 
I do this show only so that I can see how you capitalize or spell these captions. All right. All right. That's going to do it for this week. <laughs> there you go. We'll see you guys next week. We're reaching the top. A lot has changed since Card Ladder began. We started with 500 cards in our database, and now we have over 3 million cards and over 30 million sales. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. With Card Ladder's sales history feature, we have virtually every card in our system. If the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms, you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history. And you can add a card to your collection with just one click. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Plus, Every card, no matter the last time it's sold, has an estimated value that we calculated using our state-of-the-art player indexes. Unlike other apps, when you see Card Ladder's verified check mark, that means a researcher personally vetted each and every sale. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. We know what you want because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder. Constantly innovating. Try it for free. See why Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Card Ladder 2.0.